or home in need of help. I'm disgusted, I'm saddened, um, my heart's broken. Nearly half the residents have COVID-19 and their families are trying desperately to keep them alive. Plus, please stay home. An urgent plea from the mayor as the holidays and another lockdown are just days away. And the Raps are back. We're checking in with fans to see how they're cheering the team on. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. Well, the Toronto Raptors are back on the court tonight for their home opener. Normally, they'd be playing at home here in Toronto. But this is a year like no other. The players making Tampa their temporary home base. That's where they faced off against the New Orleans Pelicans tonight. Let's go live to our Dahlia Ashry. She's at Nathan Phillips Square. And Dahlia, the Toronto sign behind you lit up in honor of the Raps. Uh, big game tonight. That's right, Kelda. Like you said, it was a big game tonight for the Raptors and a close game indeed. They lost their first opener in eight years by 14 points. Now, that didn't stop the city from showing some love to the Raptors by lighting up the Toronto Sanchez right behind me in black and red. Um, and, you know, it's an unusual time uh, for the Raptors this year, as usually they have their first home game here in Toronto, but they've had to make that shift due to not being able to play in Canada because of the COVID risk. So they've had to have their new temporary home uh, in Tampa playing uh, earlier this evening at the Emily Arena. Now, it's not just an unusual time for the players, but it's also a difficult time for the Toronto Raptors fans here at home, but they still try to show some support. I spoke to one fan who told me, even though it was disappointing that he couldn't watch the team play here in Toronto for the first home opening game, he still wants to show his love and support. Oh, oh. We all remember this. A loud and packed Jurassic Park for the Raptors home opener in 2019. Tonight's a much quieter scene. Hanan Molana is a big Raptors fan. He was among the thousands who poured into the streets of Toronto to celebrate the big win in 2019. This evening... Let's go Raptors! Let's go! We can't go to Jurassic Park, but we're going to be in our own parks yelling and screaming. And, you know, we're going to try to make sure we scream out to Tampa. I don't know if you'll hear us, but I know you'll definitely feel us. He cheered on the We the North as they play down south from the comfort of his home. A little sad, a little disconnected from the team, if you will. But there's obviously a lot of other ways that we can show them support with online and, uh, you know, videos and social media. It's been a whole new ball game for the players to adjust to due to the pandemic. This is the practice court right here. With their new home base in Tampa, Raptors shooting guard Matt Thomas says he's still figuring out his routine. Finding a place to live, you know, getting furniture in your place, um, all those little things. Um, and then obviously trying to get ready and, and be in training camp and prepare yourself mentally and physically for an NBA season. Um, so I'm still, you know, getting settled and getting adjusted. This season, there will be 72 games instead of the usual 82. And while that means fewer games, Thomas says he and his teammates are ready to step up. Obviously things can change very quickly. And um, it just is a testament that guys need to stay ready, um, stay in shape, stay ready for when the number's called. The Raptors will be without two familiar faces this time around, veteran Serge Ibaka and Mark Gasol, but Milana is hopeful the Raps can still go far, saying he's rooting for one of his favorites, Kyle Lowry, to come through. We hope that he continues a good, solid season, stays healthy, and uh, brings us back to the promised land. Now, as we head into the province-wide lockdown on Saturday, that means no Boxing Day shopping. But for those of you who would rather stay at home and will most likely be staying at home, you can probably watch the Raptors go head-to-head -head with the San Antonio Spurs. Kelda? That sounds like the perfect plan. Thanks so much, Dahlia. That was our Dahlia Ashley reporting live for us tonight. Turning to the pandemic now, Ontario is reporting its second highest daily number of COVID-19 cases today and 41 new deaths. The province saw 2,408 new infections, most of which are in the usual hot areas. Now, Toronto has 629 new cases, Peel Region reporting 448, and there are 234 new infections in Windsor, Essex. 1,002 people are hospitalized with the virus, 275 of them in intensive care units, 186 requiring the use of a ventilator to breathe.
Now, COVID-19 is wreaking havoc on one Scarborough long-term care home. 145 residents have tested positive for the virus at Tender Care Living Center. 26 residents have died. Now, workers at the home and residents' families say they need help now. Talia Ricci spoke to some of them. I feel like we had to take matters into our own hands to find out what's going on there. And now that they do know, Jessica Wong says her family is removing her grandmother from Tender Care Living Center. It's completely out of control. It's in crisis mode. But whatever it takes, there are lives there that still needs to be saved. And there's not enough staff to help the ones that are positive. It becomes complicated. A crisis witnessed by one physician who got called into the home to help this weekend. She's been having trouble sleeping since then. I had one um, nurse with me and two PSWs on Sunday for the wing that I was taking care of, and that's nowhere near enough. Many of the residents were in various states of dehydration. We know that 40 plus or 50 plus workers are sick at tender care are in isolation. But how many people are still working there is, is a myth. A statement to CBC News from the Ministry of Long-Term Care said in part, it has completed an inspection of the home and is determining the next actions to take, and that a report will be made available on the public website once it's complete and shared with the home. A tender care spokesperson confirmed late this afternoon that a management agreement with North York General Hospital will soon be finalized to better help the home fight the outbreak. This is certainly a tragic situation by the description of it, and so if uh, advice is offered that we should ask for help, I'll certainly join in making that request. Everyone who I saw there on Sunday was working incredibly hard, nonstop. Um, I think their assistant director of care, I don't even know if she was going home. I think she, you know, it's quite likely she was practically sleeping there. Wong says her grandma is a fighter. She held part of her wedding celebration at the home just so she could take part but she's hoping to soon bring the 82-year-old home. We are just waiting on her next test results. As soon as we find out, um, hopefully she's still negative, we can take her out that same day. In a newsletter to families, Tender Care says that it's monitoring residents for symptoms twice a day, including taking their temperature and isolating those who show symptoms. They're also screening staff and say there are extensive cleaning protocols. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Mississauga's Fire and Emergency Services Department has confirmed 11 positive cases of COVID-19. A news release sent out just a few hours ago says 36 additional staff are self-isolating. Now, this affects four fire stations in the, that city. The acting fire chief says crews from other stations will help fill the gaps in staffing. City fire stations are not open to the public, and firefighters respond to calls in full PPE. The city says they are coordinating with Peel Public Health to ensure isolation and testing protocols are being followed. And here in Toronto, the last COVID briefing of the year was held today. The focus, of course, were the holidays and the provincial lockdown, now just two days away. Natalie Nanowski has more. Please stay home. And I urge people again to understand that this Christmas has to be different. At the city's last press conference of the year, the mayor repeated what we've been hearing for months. But with Christmas Eve a day away, officials say they've been hearing creative ways people are trying to get around the rule of only getting together with the people you live with. We've heard the asterisk, asterisk that says, well, that's okay to do otherwise if you have a test, or it's okay because it's only your grandmother, or it's okay because it's just a couple of people we're having over. There are no asterisks beside this. Toronto has been in lockdown since November 23rd. Still, cases have climbed. Today, there are 321 people in hospital and 17 new deaths. People might say, well, is this lockdown working? And I would say absolutely. I think if we didn't have the lockdown, we'd be seeing much, much higher rates. You know, if you look at, for example, Alberta, they have, um, you know, the equivalent of 5,000 uh, cases of COVID a day if you compare to population. Alberta's businesses have stayed open longer. Toronto's bars and restaurants have been quiet for a while. Others have flatlined. Since March, the city has changed. Its bustling core has been a ghost town for months. 
People have moved out of their condos to homes in the suburbs, while Toronto's homeless have pitched tents in parks in order to avoid shelters. Experts warn if we don't stay home over the holidays, we could face a tsunami of cases at the start of the new year, and hospitals will be maxed out. There's no ICU bed, or there's no way that that person could be on a, a ventilation machine, then that person would die. And so, you know, by staying at home, we are, um, you know, protecting all of us and, you know, potentially saving lives. Lockdown across the province begins Boxing Day. It will remain in place for 27 public health regions until at least January 23rd. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. Now, already thousands of healthcare workers throughout the province have been given the COVID-19 vaccine, but there is concern even as immunizations ramp up, hesitancy among frontline staff may prove to be a challenge. Lauren Pelly has more. Long-term care worker Melissa Vitug was first in line to get a COVID-19 vaccine at St. Michael's Hospital. Congratulations. Thank you. But her decision came with mixed emotions. I'm nervous. At the same time, I'm feeling positive and hopeful about this pandemic to end. One by one, other frontline workers got their shots as well, all part of the first cohort being vaccinated in Ontario. Around 140 people were expected out for the first day of this vaccination clinic. And this is just the beginning. We're going to be focusing on frontline staff for long-term care. Uh, in the next week or two, uh, and as long as it takes. The next group will be uh, retirement homes, also frontline clinical staff from hospitals, and essential caregivers. We are starting from a place of, you know, real troubles with vaccine acceptance. Dr. Nathan Stahl happily got his shot this week, but he warns not all healthcare workers will be so eager. Public Health Ontario data shows on average only around three quarters of long-term care staff got the flu shot over the last three years and just over half of all hospital staff. There's the perception from some that they're the guinea pigs in terms of all of this uh, vaccination campaign. Experts say communication with frontline staff will be key going forward, helping wary workers understand how the vaccine's protective benefits against COVID-19 far outweigh any risks. We are not hearing much about major adverse symptoms that are coming to light, especially as this is an incredibly scrutinized vaccine. For Vita, getting the shot wound up a no-brainer since she's caring for some of Ontario's most vulnerable residents. I think I'm feeling much more courageous and going to work every day. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. A powerful winter storm arrives just in time for Christmas Eve. I'll tell you what it means for your plans after the break.
let's take a look outside. It's a mild and cloudy night out there, and we are expecting to see some light drizzle through the overnight. Let's go now to our meteorologist, Nick Cernkovich, who has the full forecast for us. Now, Nick, those uh, dreaming of a white Christmas may just get their wish. Hi, Calda. Well, we are looking at a powerful winter storm that's headed uh, for not just the GTA, but all of southern Ontario. It's been making its way across the country for the last couple of days. Environment Canada issuing uh, special weather statements and warnings in some areas. Uh, rainfall totals with this initially upwards to about 25, even more millimetres of rain, especially to the north there, up to about 40 millimetres of rain. And then in behind it, snowfall that could reach 20 centimetres. Uh, but it will be very location dependent. All of this, by the way, combined with some pretty strong winds as well. It's part of this system over here. And uh, as we move through tonight, we're starting to see the leading edge of this. So some rain showers across the GTA in southern Ontario tonight. By tomorrow morning, we're into that full on rain or heavier rain showers and they continue through sort of the first half of the day. But this is the cold front over here, which slides through the Windsor area in the morning. But by the afternoon, it moves through uh, the GTA and the Golden Horseshoe and then temperatures start to drop pretty quickly and in behind it we've got some snowfall to speak of now the models still pretty undecided with this thing as to exact amounts and I wouldn't be surprised if we don't get that much in some parts of the GTA uh, but that being said we're sitting right on the sort of transition zone so definitely calling for snow in this case here but it, the question is whether we stay in that sort of mix for a while or whether we transition right over to snowfall. Uh, in either case, by Friday, Christmas Day, and moving into Saturday, temperatures drop and we'll see some lingering snow flurries or snowfall. Now, how much rain can we expect? That's a broad look uh, before we switch over to snowfall. So about 10 to 20 millimeters, although, it, like I said, heavier amounts to areas north like Gravenhurst. And then snowfall here, this model calling for 10 centimeters in the GTA, others calling for a bit less. So I'd say generally five to 10 centimeters of snow, but it will vary across the city and it'll probably be kind of a, a messy mix at least initially anyway before the temperatures start to drop on uh, on Friday temperatures today by the way up to five degrees and uh, they're pretty much holding steady through tonight and that's why we're seeing rain showers uh, southwestern Ontario up to nine degrees in Windsor through the overnight period tonight gusty winds out of the south pumping in that uh, warmer air and then we've got uh, the potential for up to about five centimeters of snow and blowing snow there mixed precipitation as you head eastward golden horseshoe again a mild night as well down to about five degrees a few showers kicking in and then steadier rainfall temperatures falling through the afternoon switching over to uh, a mix and then finally over to some snowfall through Christmas Eve uh, night and into Christmas Day. So there is a look at the next five days. Most of the action happening right here in the next two, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Big drop in temperatures and definitely messy for travel as you go through Thursday and even Friday. All right, thanks so much, Nick. The weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We test, so it runs. It's hard to stop a train. Cyber fraud is on the rise in Canada, and some experts say the pandemic is likely contributing to it. A one Toronto man says he wants to warn others after he almost fell victim to an online job scam. Greg Ross reports. Antonio James knows all too well how difficult it can be to find a job in this pandemic. Uh, just been doing anything to survive, really, like just any work that I can. With a newborn baby on the way, he is currently delivering for Instacart and driving for Lyft to try and make ends meet. Uh, right now I was applying in places like EGG, Indeed, uh, Craigslist, Job, Job Ready, I think it's called One as well. He recently got a job offer from what he thought was a cryptocurrency company that he had applied to online. They sent me an email telling me that I do feel the, feel the position that they're looking for. He was told the job paid $1,300 a week, which he was eager to accept. But something strange happened after he provided the company with all of his personal information. They wanted me to go and deposit money into, a, into an account. James was instructed to deposit $20 into a Bitcoin account using a machine like this. I got worried and I started uh, searching right away on my phone. I told my wife, you know, like, I feel like this is not, not right. I have a little, you know, that little thing that tells you inside that something is wrong. His instincts were correct. James quickly realized he was being scammed and he's not alone. And job scams are one of the, the scams we've been paying attention to. And there's certainly numbers have increased. Um, 
We're upwards of 2,100 reports as of the end of November, up from uh, 1,700 in, in all of 2019. So, According to this uh, RCMP intelligence analyst, the pandemic has actually helped the people who orchestrate this type of fraud. The pandemic, everything's a little bit more virtual, right? More people doing business online. And it's not just money that they're after. There's the financial fraud that, that's happened or the, sort of the solicitation that's happened, but at the same time, now they've harvested your personal information. Even though James didn't send any cash to the fraudsters, he now has to worry about his identity being stolen. These days, he's a lot more cautious. I become more and more worried about it, more careful, because I get a lot of emails telling me, oh yeah, for managing position here and there. Uh, but I'm just afraid, I guess. According to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, if you feel that you have been the victim of a cyber fraud, you should immediately report it to the local police as well as the Anti-Fraud Centre. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, almost a year after the pandemic hit Toronto, we check in with a doctor who inspired our Frontline Heroes series. His story, right after the break.
Well, this week, we're checking back with some of our frontline heroes. We featured a number of people on the front lines earlier on in the pandemic. And for many, a lot has changed. Dr. Gray Moonen helped to inspire the series, sharing the stories of workers at Toronto Western Hospital. Well, now he says he's growing frustrated with those who are letting down their guard. Taylor Simmons spoke to him. A lot of my colleagues and I are like we've been running a marathon for like 10 months and nine months, whatever, whatever it is, I don't even know, but it's challenging. And I, and I am seeing a little bit of burnout in, in my colleagues. And, you know, I've had more sad days and, and tough days over the last year than I've probably had in the last 20 combined. What are some of the things that you've seen on the front line that have stuck with you throughout all these months? Oh my God. It's changed so much. Uh, at the beginning, there was a lot of fear and uncertainty. I was doing obstetrics and gynecology and we had like COVID moms and we had no idea if they were gonna have, you know, healthy pregnancies. We didn't know if they were gonna have healthy deliveries. As things have evolved, we've learned more about how to manage the virus. I'm thinking a lot more about the kind of knock on effects of this pandemic and the mental health kind of crises, the delays in all of the care that I'm seeing, uh, the stress that that's caused. You mentioned that for a lot of your patients, you're having trouble even booking things now or having to cancel, delay things. That must be tough. I don't think a lot of people at home realize how stressful this is for yeah. doctors and residents and, nurse, uh, and nurses and all allied health when you know, we're not always able to provide the level of care that we want to provide. I'm hopeful that it's a small fraction of the people that are, you know, thinking this is a made up thing or thinking this is a, you know, not a serious thing. It's not nice to tell someone that they're dying in the hospital and they're, you, your kids and your family cannot visit. You can't have visitors in the hospital in a lot of hospitals. So you, if you have coronavirus and you are in the intensive care unit or you're on the wards, you're dying alone, unfortunately. And that's, that's a really, really, traumatic thing for not only like the patient and the family but all of the care providers around people tend to think that doctors you know we see death and we see dying and we see illness all the time but it still has a big effect on us you know we're still human overall we've done okay and if we just bear down for the next you know hopefully six months it's gonna it's gonna suck but there is a light at the end of the tunnel truly and that's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. We'll leave you with some shots of a Toronto tradition, skating at Nathan Phillips Square. Adoy Drummond will have your next local newscast tomorrow at 6, and there will be no late-night newscast on Christmas Eve. Have a great night.